All right. So, um, Deepika, I'm going to be interviewing you. And I guess, first of all, why don't we talk a little bit about, you know, when you think about the early days of Athelis, I the company was so different. The, um, I mean, the vibe was so different. I think what we were accomplishing in the, in the initial years just looked so different than, than what the company is today. Uh, one of the things that always stood out to me was, and it's, you know, it's true today, it's true back then, um, is, is, is your discipline. You know, you, you have a sense of there, there's, it's almost like a sense of duty where when you're, when you're working on something, um, it doesn't matter what it, it's about getting it done and bringing it to the finish line. Uh, talk me through, you know, one of your days in the lab running our first you know, first bench trials or our first clinical trial. And, you know, let would, would love to just kind of hear and, and, you know, just you retelling the story of, of how we went from this hacked together prototype um, to something that people actually, thousands of patients actually use today. Uh, and just, you know, why all the learnings, I think, from, from that initial stage up until now, how, how, how they kind of permeate the company. Yeah. So, I think that um, I specifically remember like while we were in YC, there was um, one day. So when we were in YC, we had we had our concept generally down, but the test strip and the device were not necessarily working with each other. Um, and it was super stressful because we wanted to we wanted to end YC with a bang. And we knew the only way we could do that is to do a trial a clinical trial end to end and the only way we could do a clinical trial end to end was if we had a working device and strip and so i remember us talking when we were working out of my house and we were saying you know we're not going to go to sleep until we figure out how this strip works yep. um and that i remember it was like I sleep relatively early compared to today. Today sleeps at like four o'clock AM, 5 AM, things like that. Um, but I remember it was like, you know, we were working all day and then it was like midnight. It was like one, two, and it just started feeling like really hopeless, honestly. Like, yeah. it was just like, what is like, there's few things in my mind that you can't brute force with just hours, yeah. you know, just like raw work hours. Yeah. And, um, this, it was just like, so jarring to be like, Oh, this is like, this could be one of those things, you know, and, like, and so, you know, for context, one, what we're working on is we're, we're sitting there with these little microfluidic test strip channels that we've fabbed ourselves. We have the device that's like duct taped together. We're in your garage, in your family garage. Um, and we're trying to, we're, we're trying to make it so that we get consistent results, you know, from, from this initial prototype. And it's clear that it works, but there's, you know, little things will happen where the software will bug out, you know, maybe the, the camera will fall off. It'll go out of focus. Um, maybe the test strip doesn't fill up correctly. And we're sitting there and we're like, we're not going to do this. Like it's, 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 yeah. it's not gonna be done. Like, it's just not going to happen. Like this it's is a scientific happen. problem and it's not going to happen. Yeah, exactly. And it was like, we had the trial, like, t like a week out or something like that. Yeah. And I remember we eventually called it like in the early hours of the morning yeah. and it was just like going home and like being that, like, we did all that work and like and the other the other thing is is that i didn't drive back then i actually learned how to drive oh my day. god i had to so drive before, to his house before, drop him off and literally through high school deepka would i don't know why she did this i to this day i don't I, know, I, why, I know I why she did this but um she would she would drive she would literally drop me off home and then she would have to drive back home and uh yeah, I mean, it was, we it was very bad. close to each other. So it wasn't yeah. like that. Yeah. It was like yeah. three minutes. Yeah. But, um, but the thing is that I remember going home and then, you know, being like, cool, like this is what it is. But there was something to that though, that I think that when you get your mind yeah. so in this mode where the only thing, it was like the only thing that I could think about, you know, and I remember waking up the next morning and like, it's only because your mind is in that place where it's like, 
survival that you're just like thinking about all these things and then that's when we were like oh the capillary you know like those like remember this the vitro comms yeah yeah yeah, yeah the vitro comms exactly yeah. yeah and that's when we started like thinking about that and and then that's really where it turned because we were like you know we can actually get a viable like test strip at least a viable distribution of like the blood at that point and um i really feel like that's what made it possible for us to do that trial at least that'd be one of it i mean obviously the strip had a long way to go but that was i mean it let us prove the concept in a very clean specific yeah. um and i you know what's crazy is so so anyways where i remember that night i remember the exact night you're talking about that night i was like we have to we have to put off the trial we have to reschedule it and you were like dude, we can't like, like PETA scheduled this trial. PETA was, you know, she, she eventually came on as our full-time head of clinical operations. But before then we were working with her and, you know, she was just doing this out of the goodness of her heart that, you know, the hospital that her family worked with in, in Mexico. And, um, I, I, and you were like, dude, no, like PETA scheduled this clinical trial. We are making this thing work. So anyways, we, we, we do, we scrape it together. We get it together. We fly out to Mexico. Um, and it's, the two of us and PETA, and we're running a 300 person clinical trial. We are way out of our depth. Yeah. But what do we, what, what, what happens next? Like, you know, it, like what, what, what do you remember like sitting out there, you know, running sample? Well, by sample? Yeah. So first of all, we flew into El Paso. And yeah. so the trial was being run in Juarez. And so I remember first, before we even left um, to Juarez, we watched Sicario. Um, do you remember we watched that in my house? Yes. And I, you, I feel like that was purely to scare me because you had already <laughs> seen the movie. That you were, yeah, I had already me. seen the movie. Yeah. But I had to explain to today where we were going. And so um, we flew into El Paso and then you crossed the border into Juarez. And that's where this hospital was. And, you know, it was so, so hot. Um, like that's like the most visceral like memory that I have is just like it was unbelievably hot and like we were like water was like we needed to get water bottles um, and I remember when we were there um, so we set up this table in the front and we said basically free blood tests for everyone who comes in um, and on one side of the table was our device to do the finger stick blood test. And on the other side of the table, there was a nurse there who was doing a venipuncture to actually test that blood on their, you know, whatever um, kind of Dismix. or yeah. Yeah, yeah, that they had. And so um, we had these patients come one by one and do both of our tests. And, and Tanae was actually in the back, in, in the back of the hospital, um, reviewing just samples, just one by one by one um because just to make sure that they were being collected properly because it was a vision-based approach and so he was able to look at them in real time and we met all kinds of patients um it, it was really really cool i mean we, that was i was not expecting to get that kind of volume that kind of traffic um but the the one that we always talk about like even to this day of course we'll always talk about it is this one patient who came in um previously you know, like, like a healthy patient, she had actually come because it was free blood testing and right. it was like her relative had come the previous day. And so she came that day with like yeah. her kids and stuff. And, um, she did her, you know, test with our finger stick blood test and I'm just running it. And then she goes to the other side of the table where the nurse is doing the venipuncture. And then Tanae comes out back and he's like, like, he's just like kind of looking at me thinking like, what's going on. And I was like, I mean, you seem so frazzled. And what did you see? I mean, it was, again, this is one of those things you, you never forget it, right? Because we're, we're sitting there, we're running, it's like a, three people running a clinical trial. We have no job running a clinical trial. We're already out of our depth. And I just remember like, there's this feeling like, damn, like, I don't, I, you know, like what, like, what am I, I know, doing? You know I mean, what I remember? I remember yeah. being like, what does one wear to the first day of like a clinical trial? <laughs> And I look at what I'm wearing. And it's like a bright orange dress with like chains. I was like, what? I was like, this is exactly what people wear for clinical trials. <laughs> and, but we're like way out of our depth and we're, 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 you know, by some, you know, some luck, we're able to run this to begin with. Like most people, Stanford quoted us like a million dollars to run a trial, um, you know, in like yeah. six months or some crazy process like that. You know, the bureaucrats doing bureaucratic things. And um, and anyways, like 
I'm in here and on, I, I see the sample and you see like way more white blood cells. And, you know, the model is classified like basically a white blood cell count, like 30 or 40,000 white blood cells per microliter. And then more, more starkly, like the visual depiction is like, you see all these cells that are like clearly missized. Like, I mean, they're, they're, they're blast cells are larger. They have, you know, um, malformed nuclei, like they're, they're, they're immature cells. And, um, I, I mean, immediately like me and someone who has very little healthcare knowledge, like this is leukemia, like this is leukemia. Like, who do I tell? Like, what is the process here? Like, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a doctor. Um, but someone needs to tell someone. And, and then I think, uh, I, you know, I, I was like, I'm going to go tell Deepika. And, and so I walked out, I found you, I was like holding the sample. I was like, dude, like this patient, like, I think they have leukemia. Like, what do we do? Um, and I remember it was such a different experience because he was in the back and he's looking at images, right? It's just like, it's just hundreds of images, thousands of images. Yeah. And for me, it's such a different experience because I'm talking to these patients. Like yeah. I'm like speaking this very broken Spanish and, yeah. you know, meeting their families and all of that. And so when you- I remember the fa your favorite word that you wouldn't stop listo. saying for the rest, listo. It was like everything. It's like, like listo and you prick them and then like, done. we come well, back and then like, we order food. It's like listo. And you're just dealing with that for at least a couple of weeks, but yeah. But he came out and it was such a different experience because he's coming out like being like, wow, I can't believe we caught this. And for me, it's like, I'm speaking to this patient yeah, who it's a person. has cancer, right? And so yeah, like, undetected, remember, like undetected by undetected. doctors who, pre who saw her that day. Exactly. And like, for me, I had spent so much of my previous years, like researching in a lab and like doing all this lab work. And it was like kind of the first time that that gap was like fully bridged. Um, yeah. And you can say like translational, whatever, like you can say you're doing translational work at Stanford, but like, it's really never as it was never as stark as it was in that moment. And yeah. um, we flagged it to the hospital, the, the hospital, like, takes it takes time right for them to actually confirm that result and let the patient know and you know well before that they had confirmed it we were on our way back um to to california um we were actually going to our yc um like weekly update meeting yeah and i remember in the plane today and i were just talking you know like this this whole thing like what we just witnessed like this is the business right this is the healthcare system failing a patient this is the healthcare system being at, at the peak of being just a reactive healthcare system yep. right and so instead of preventative yeah instead of being a preventative healthcare and, system. And, and i think like like it almost i remember i was sitting next to you on a flight like we've sat together on many flights before for for context somehow I get airsick. yeah i get air sick on airplanes deep because yeah. always the one next to me and ends up she literally like points and laughs as i throw up um it, it's just the process. And um, we, and I was like, it almost doesn't matter how long it takes. It almost doesn't matter. Like all the random shit that happens in between, like this is the business. Like this is like, there is this model needs to switch from being reactive to a model that is preventative and we're going to figure it out. And our first jab at that, our first start is this a Thales one device? Because if we can detect leukemia early, if we can monitor white blood cells and neutrophils in cancer patients, well, I mean, that's just a start, but it, there's so much we can do with that, with that yeah. thesis. Uh, and so I think, I think with that, it's really what kicked off the, um, the, the, the journey for step one of a Thales, right? Like, which was, let's go make this thing real. Like we witnessed the healthcare system at its worst let's 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 go build tools that actually let doctors and patients um do better and and i guess you know so anyways talk me through a little bit about you know we're it's the two of us right like we're like best friends like somewhat and um and and we're and we're we're working together on this thing and it's like well it needs to change like it needs to go from being the two of us working on this thing to it needs to become a company like it needs to turn into something that's like very real. And I guess, you know, real quick, just talk me through that transition. It took us a couple months, I think, to really nail it because for a long time, we almost, you know, there's, there's like four to five months there where I think we did struggle with the transition. And then we hired some incredible people and, and it started to turn into. Yeah. Into yeah. And actually, I think that 
you did a really good job of this. I think that I, you know, we were working out of my house and I was like post YC and everyone will talk about this, like post YC, like slump. And it was a real thing that we had. Um, and you know, there was one day where today was just like, we need to get an office. Like we raised this round, like we need to get an office and just a, just getting an office at, if you do it at the right time, it just makes everything to feel different. You know, it's like you come, you show up to work, you, you know, you, you make that choice to leave your office and like, you don't leave your office until you feel like you've accomplished something. And, you know, there'll be days that you're like, what actually did I do? It's, it's like, there's definitely a different feeling. And then you also hire people that are like far, far smarter than, well, you far smarter than you. Um, and I think that, and I think that that makes, it makes a huge difference, you know, then you, and then it feels like a team's coming together and then you feel like you have momentum and you're like, this could happen. Like, this is something that's like, could happen. Um, so, but, but there was definitely, yeah, there was definitely a bit of a struggle. There, there. was that post YC slum. Yeah. And I think it, it was, it was crazy because like, I mean, I, I think that transition was so key for us. And I think um, like one, one of the things that you, like you, you did incredible in that period was like, how do we, like you brought that sense of culture, I think from the beginning, which was like, we're not just here, like slogging crazy hours, like we're building for a purpose and you, you very clearly made it. I mean, it was like, we're going to lead from the front. Like you would go to Stanford and do 15 hour days if you had to, to run venture clinical samples when honestly, maybe like the, you know, the conventional move would have been to hire trial operators. But I think it was so important to set that tone of like, no, the, the leaders are, they're in the trenches. And, and, and I think when people saw you doing that, I mean, for Steve, for Drew, for every early employee, it became like, okay, well, Deepka's in the trenches. She's running this trial um, or she's, you know, like tr trying out this new, you know, this, this new iteration of, of our product and she's doing it herself where she's literally making the test strips herself for the first, you know, prototype. I think that set the tone for you look, we have like 80, 90 people now, everyone feels that and everyone reads that. And it wouldn't have been possible without those initial couple months of, of, I think you setting that tone in the office, because it was honestly important for me too. Like, I, it, like, I, I don't think I would have been like that had it not been for been, been for that direction that was set so early. Yeah. That's really nice. thing. <laughs> the last one. It's the last nice thing I'll say. Um, great. Well, thank you for letting me interview you and letting me chime in. I'm, uh, I'm glad to know that we're, uh, we, we remember the early days the same way and I will see you soon. <laughs> okay. I'll see you next door. Goodbye. I'll see Bye. you next door.